Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Gio here, and yes, we finally made it to the end of 2021 and my anime season reviews, this time for the fall season of 2021. So a lot of returning shows from previous seasons. I'm not gonna go through most of these because I've already talked about them at length, especially stuff like Dragon Quest Adventures of Die. I've talked about it since 2020 in every single season. Uh, I've raved about how much I love it. Sure, the animation dips here and there. It, it isn't necessarily the smoothest looking show recently. And I get it, Toei Animation has a history of this, especially with long running series. And it's hard to animate something uh, week to week for more than a year straight. I totally understand. But I wish those beautiful looking episodes from the start of the series would come back animation wise. So yeah, a wonderful series. Once again, I love uh, Dragon Quest Adventures of Dai. The great Yahisama will not be defeated. It is another great comedic anime. I really did enjoy it. It's a very episodic adventure with Yahisama trying to uh, rebuild the demon kingdom, uh, the demon realm, I guess, and uh, failing spectacularly through her ego or just random shenanigans that happen throughout the episodes. The cast of characters, I really enjoyed. They really made this show what it is. The plot, there's not really much there. It's just her hijinks of trying to restore the demon realm and getting her powers back. It's mostly about the characters and the kooky antics they get themselves involved in. I really enjoyed it. Fun, great show with awesome voice acting. Shaman King. Little tropey here and there, but then again, it's an older series, and I gotta admit, I watched the older show back in the day, but I don't remember certain aspects of it, and I don't think I ever finished reading the manga either, so a lot of the content that I'm watching from Shaman King is actually new stuff, which is exciting. Animation's not that great, and at times, I think the original still holds up, more than this new one, to be honest. Certain uh, aspects of the fights and the tournaments I could care less about, honestly, and it's the heavy drama-filled uh, talkative episodes that I enjoy from Shaman King. I don't know, maybe maybe it's because it relies too heavily on the battle shonen mechanics and I'm into other type of shows. I don't know, for some reason I'm not digging Shaman King reboot as as much as I thought I was going to. Kyo in Kyoto, a warm slice of wholesome pie, a wonderful monthly series. I believe we're one episode away from finishing it. I can't believe it took a whole year. But it's interesting, nonetheless, you know, having uh, the characters in this environment with the geishas in training, the Mako house, if I remember correctly, and the main character being the cook, uh, the chef, and uh, the adventures that the girls get into and learning about that culture and the job of a geisha in training and all that stuff, really awesome. And the cooking segments are hilarious. Highly recommended just for that a nice uh, slice of life series that you can just relax and uh, enjoy and, and get rid of all your frustrations as you're watching these girls uh, doing their thing. Aquatope on White Sand. Honestly, one of my favorite shows of 2021. A fantastic series, great characters, beautiful animation, the character backgrounds and the setting overall uh, being in, I, I believe it was Okinawa, correct me if I'm wrong, I probably am. But being down south in uh, Japan was a smart move because it's such a visually striking area and it involves uh, fish and sea life and of course it being in aquariums. You really want to be there with all the fishes and how beautiful everything looks and the penguins and seals and, and all that crazy stuff. Now the actual plot when I first reviewed on this channel the first 12 episodes, it kind of felt like a definitive end to the story. Usually shows like that will wrap up in 12 episodes and leave you sort of a coda of things to come if they ever make a sequel. In this case, we got another bunch of 12 episodes continuing the story and what really felt like a season two instead of a later half of a season, if you will. 
I'm not, uh, I'm not complaining though, because it was really well done. It jumps forward in time. The characters are a little bit older. They are facing more uh, serious grown up situations as they're working in the aquarium in the new one and getting accustomed to uh, the working life and all that stuff. New people to interact with, new business dealings and uh, marketing and field work and all that stuff that the main characters were not used to because their previous aquarium that they were working on uh, was simpler, more of a mom and pop shop, if you will. Now it's sort of this big conglomerate that's built this super duper awesome aquarium. Uh, just an overall fantastic series. I highly recommend it. Again, like I mentioned, the animation is probably one of the highest selling points. I love progressive animation. They do fantastic work. And this was not the exception. I absolutely loved it. And I can't wait to talk about this series at length because I do think everybody should check it out. If you're into some good slice of life drama with wonderful, kooky, uh, wholesome characters and these girls doing amazing uh, work in the field of marine life, I highly recommend Aquatope on White Sand. Yashahime season two. Now, while I did enjoy the characters in season one, especially the three girls, I complained that it had a lot of episodes that were really uh, pointless and filler-ish. And there are some here at the start of season two because we've already seen 12 episodes of it out of the 24. But for the most part, it really picked up on the pacing and explaining things and solving some major issues from the first season, and resolving some plot threads and creating new ones, of course, for the later half of the show. I'm really excited to see where it goes. I'm honestly uh, super psyched to see a certain reunions take place. Don't worry, I'm not spoiling anything by that. And uh, overall, just a really nice upgrade to the first run of Yashahime. Again, probably the biggest selling point are the three girls and how uh, great they are as characters. And yeah, I'm looking forward to more of Yashahime. Demon Slayer. Demon Slayer is interesting. Mugen Train premiered last year. I didn't watch it. I watched it this year when it debuted on Crunchyroll. Fantastic film, a great adaptation of the Mugen Train storyline. Then they announced the weird decision to split it up into a mini arc of, I think it was seven or eight episodes on TV. I just watched it just for, I don't know, just to say that I watched it. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm kind of done with the Mugen Train because I watched the movie, then I jumped over to the TV show and I watched that. It was exactly the same thing, so I just skipped a bunch of scenes, honestly. And then when I started the Red Light District or the Entertainment District or ARC or whatever, the beginning references stuff from Mugen Train. I'm like, guys, guys, no, I, I can't. I, I watched everything in, in one after the other. I can't deal with the Mugen Train uh, enough. <laughs> it's a beautifully animated movie and I get the hype, but like, let's move on. The actual entertainment district arc or the red light district arc, if you will, is really awesome. And I think looks even better than the animation on season one and the movie. Obviously, you know, UFO Table, they have a track record of excellence and yeah, it's, it's Demon Slayer. It's gonna look gorgeous and I'm super excited about it to get more stuff uh, animated from this uh, fun manga that I love. Mushuko Tensei, Jobless Reincarnation, the second part of the first season. I love this series so much. I talked about the first half back uh, early 2021 and how much I liked it the progression of characters like Rudius and to see that, yeah, there are a lot of pervy jokes and humors and, and situations in the series, but it's justified in that you have this character that gets a second chance and you get to see his evolution as a character and how uh, he moves forward. And of course the amazing world building and all these wonderful characters learning about their histories and the lore and, and the folklore in this realm. And now that they're separated and trying to find each other again after the whole mana disaster thing, I love this series so much. I cannot wait to dig in into the light novels. That's something that I'm gonna be hunting down in 2022 and hopefully uh, reading the whole thing. I'm super excited for more Mushigo Tensei. Hopefully season two is around the corner. Komi can't communicate. 
a wonderful rom-com. I know some people are not digging certain characters, but you got to understand that these characters, you know, it's more of a satire of rom-coms and it's over, uh, it's a little exaggerated with the way that they idolize Comey, but it's really endearing and sweet and wholesome to see her progress through the episodes and the story as she gains friends and is able to slowly but surely uh, jump over hurdles of communicating with people and all that stuff. A wonderfully animated series, OLM Studios, if I remember correctly, doing a phenomenal job. I really appreciate how uh, similar it is to the manga and yet how different it is in certain aspects, especially the voice acting. Phenomenal, it's really funny on that regard. Platinum End, the anime based on the manga from the same name, the original creators, uh, of course, of Death Note. I was really excited for it because of the creative team and the original manga. I gotta say, I was a little bit let down and even though I've seen 12 episodes of it, uh, so far, uh, I don't know, I find it a little underwhelming. The art really let me down on it. The animation isn't that great. And just the plot isn't the most engaging thing, especially when you have that choppy animation, you know, characters just standing idly by, of course, with the whole wings and white and red arrows and all that stuff. It was just, it's just okay. It's a little bit too, complicated for its own good but at the same time it's not really that complicated it has similar tropes to death note so i like the comparisons between the two shows between the two worlds i should say the whole fact that it's angels and they're trying to do a battle royale thing to pick out a successor to uh, become a god and all that stuff interesting premise just the execution i don't know it's not super engaging to me 86 part 2 I wish I could tell you it was an amazing season, but we're missing two episodes that will air in March of next year, 2022. It sucks, I know, what are you gonna do? Last episode that we saw ended on a massive cliffhanger. I can't wait to see how it resolves everything that's going on right now and the themes explored with the characters and how they deal with, you know, war and, and PTSD and uh, segregation and racism and all those stuff. and the dynamics of young soldiers in war and how that affects their mental health and all that stuff. Plus, amazing kick-ass fights and visuals. Just a really solid uh, war mech show that I highly recommend you guys check out. Mieruko-chan, one of my favorite underrated shows of 2021. This was a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of Passion Studios. I think they are a really underrated animation studio and they did a really good job on this. I love the art style. I think they captured the essence of the manga pretty well, especially with the ghoulish monster designs for the apparitions. They looked super frightening and the sound design was really well done on them. Uh, the actual human characters, they're all great. And what I love is that it doesn't take itself too seriously, but at the same time, as you progress through the story, more elements start piling up and you get a really interesting story of how is this happening, what is going to happen, and how are these characters going to resolve things that are coming down the line. I'm really being as vague as possible, but honestly, do check it out. I think it's worth your time. There's a little bit of fan service here and there, but uh, don't worry about it. It's a show. It's fake characters doing fake things. Don't worry about it, guys. Tact OP Destiny. This is a multimedia franchise. It has a video game, a cell phone game, I should say. It has a manga in the works, and I'm pretty sure it's going to get a second season. I'm pretty sure it's going to get a lot of figures. It reminds me of the Fate series in that regard. I'm not a huge fan of it, unfortunately. Just Music-based shows, for some reason, are not my thing. Last year was Listeners, this year is uh, Tact OP. The story's interesting enough with these monsters killing off people and uh, banning music and all that stuff. And it's a very music-centric series and the attacks and the terminologies and all that stuff. Um, the maestros have these girls that have abilities and they turn into like super powered warriors and they fight off these monsters. And um, the best thing about Tact OP is obviously the art 
animated by two awesome studios. You got Madhouse, you got Studio Mappa doing phenomenal work, easily one of the best looking shows of 2021. I just thought the plot kind of dragged into nowhere and you get a lot of exposition dump towards the end where I honestly had lost interest and that's not a good thing. At the start of the series is interesting and then it just goes on on a lengthy road trip where kind of nothing happens. It looks gorgeous but nothing really happens until the very end and we've seen that before in 12 episode series but when you have quality uh, drawings from two major studios working together you expect every single aspect of the show to be A tier or S tier level. Unfortunately for me it wasn't quite there. The Faraway Paladin. I had heard of this from the light novels, the original novels. They have some amazing illustrations. I was really intrigued by it when I read about it and learned that it was receiving an anime annotation this year. Really solid story about this kid who turns out to be, uh, it turns out to be an isekai story in disguise. They don't really play too much of it at the stage where we're at with the show. Hopefully it does get another season so we continue this world building exercise and uh, fleshing out the characters and all that stuff. But this kid is raised in this necropolis, if you will, with three ghoulish characters and his upbringing and how uh, he moves forward in life out of that. I will say that the first half of the series is better for me. The second half goes into the world building aspect and meeting a whole bunch of characters. It's just, for some reason, the animation on this one really let me down. If you look at the visual key, if you look at the original illustrations, and then you take a look at the actual animation for it, I don't know. Plus, it's an isekai, so of course when they do attacks, they gotta freaking name them like their JRPG attack names. I'm over that stuff, honestly. But it's still a nice show where you get a whole lot of character development and world building, political play and uh, magic stuff that you'll want to keep going episode after episode. My Senpai is annoying. This is the funniest show of 2021 for me. I love this rom-com set in the workspace. You have a character, Igarashi, who is this pipsqueak, who is, she wants to be this uh, amazing businesswoman. Uh, and she uh, looks up to her senpai, um, Takeda, who is this brutish, uh, tall, ogre looking of a man. He's actually uh, quite the gentle giant and a sweetheart, but he's kind of a buffoon, if you will. And that dynamic of uh, him being sort of like the annoying older uh, sibling or, par or type parent is where the comedy lies in this show. Also, the fact that the side couples in the series get developed pretty well is really awesome. You don't see that a lot in rom-coms and stuff like that. Sakugan. Sakugan was labeled as this show that if you like Guren Lagan and Made in Abyss, you're gonna enjoy Sakugan. I was sold on that pitch, but I don't think it really delivered at all. It has similar concepts to the two series I mentioned, but it's something completely different. You have um, uh, Memempu and Gagomba, which are two of the wackiest names in recent memory, and they're living in this underground colony um, that I don't know how they get sunlight and how the people evolve to not need the sunlight. I guess I missed the explanation on that one, but they live down in, in the underground and uh, the main girl, she um, gets these visions are these dreams of a white pillar in a dark sky and she wants to go to that place of her dreams because it might be of her origin or whatever and uh, Gagumba, his uh, and Gagumba, her dad is going to accompany her in this giant robot mech thing that sort of functions as a drill machine but also a robot and they fight kaiju and get involved in crazy hijinks as they cross from colony to colony underground it's more of a road trip kind of anime. It's not until the very end of the series where you get some much needed development and explanation as to where the story's headed and what's happening. All the other episodes are just wacky adventures in different settings. So I think that's why I didn't dig it as much. Digimon Ghost Game. 
I love Digimon and the fact that you're able to mix yokai type stories with the creepier side of digital monsters and uh, make it sort of a spookier season is phenomenal. The art, I'm not a fan of whatsoever. It kind of let me down. There are certain animations like the evolution sequences that look amazing, but the show never really replicates that. And I'm sort of let down by it. There are a couple frames where it just looks bad, but the story and the characters and the new Digimon are wholesome and cute and awesome enough that I'm gonna keep watching because I'm a huge fan of the franchise regardless. Taisho Otome Fairy Tale, a wonderful historical fiction, a wonderful drama romance story of these two unlikely characters meeting and falling in love. Now, the main character is disabled and he is banished from his household because his whole family, they're just a bunch of a-holes. So now he's living on the mountainside and in their uh, villa vacation home, I guess. and. Uh, the dad buys a wife for him, turns out to be a young girl who's like three or four years younger than him. But then again, that type of thing was sort of common back in the day, right? In the 1800s or whatever, Taisho era Japan. So it doesn't surprise me. It's still, it's a fun uh, little series. Uh, animation's not the biggest thing in the world, not the most wow thing, but it's more about the romance and the characters and the voice acting and that was top notch where I really enjoyed it. And the fact that one of the characters is going to teach the other about moving forward in life and continuing and finding uh, enjoyment and love out of living and all that stuff, I'm in for that. Next up is The Vampire Dies in No Time, a random comedy series about vampires and a useless vampire at that. The main character is this uh, really weak, skinny looking guy uh, who is not worth for much and he meets this vampire hunter who's also uh, kind of dumb and the vampire hunter ends up destroying his the vampire's mansion so hijinks ensue and they end up uh, living together in the vampire hunter's apartment in the city and it's this sort of uh, classic uh, slapstick humor with Japanese bizarre jokes and tropes and there are a lot of crazy kooky characters, especially John the Armadillo, which was my favorite. Such a wholesome little guy. I could just watch a whole short series out of that character. Vampire designs are interesting. Each vampire is different with their power sets. Some are uh, kind of perverts. Others are literal monster tentacle things that I don't really understand how they function, but they're there. <laughs> And the humor goes from lowbrow to just silly slapstick. Uh, if you like that sort of thing, you're gonna have a fun time with Vampire Dies in no time. Ranking of Kings, honestly, one of the best shows of 2021. A phenomenal series where you're following Prince Boji, a young, wholesome, deaf, mute kid who is in this um, medieval type kingdom that really reminds me of children's books that I would read about these fantasy stories uh, with knights and giants and dragons and magic and all that stuff. And it's animated by Wood Studios, one of my all-time favorite animation studios. This is based off a manga of the same name. One, you get a really wholesome, beautiful kid who you want to root for, and he's such a nice character. He goes through the ringer. There are things that are happening in this series that I'm not gonna spoil, but really put him to the test and make him evolve and grow uh, and, and sort of leave that comfort shell, that protective bubble, and realize that there is potential in him. He befriends this character called Kage, this shadowy type monster uh, creature that, and just forms this really budding beautiful relationship that I I am so excited in each episode uh, I tear up at the wholesome moments and seeing uh, Boji succeeding and hopefully nothing bad happens to him. One thing that I do love about this series however is that expect the unexpected and after two episodes in things just get dark and heavy while still retaining that colorful beautiful uh chibi picturesque uh, fantasy look to it. Also, the character work on this is insane. Literally, you have characters that subvert expectations left and right. 
go watch this show, please. Finally, we got the Heike story or Heike Monogatari based on the famous Taita clan and the famous novel, uh, historical fiction novel of the same name. Now, yes, it is based of real people, but the original novel uh, added a few elements here and there, and this anime is based off of that. And honestly, this is one of the best shows I've ever seen. I really enjoyed Heike Monogatari or The Heike Story. A wonderful piece of art, fantastic all-star cast of voice actors, a beautiful uh, tragic story about the greed, rise and fall of the Taita clan. Just a phenomenal series. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, a couple years from now, I could see people revisiting this because it got overlooked this year, somehow, I don't know. Not a lot of people were watching, but I think in a couple years worth of time, people are gonna look back at the Heike Monogatari and uh, the anime and list it as one of the essential uh, feudal Japan samurai media uh, things that you consume, whether it be a manga, a live action movie, an anime, it belongs in that category of, if you wanna watch, uh, you know, shows based on feudal Japan and all that, you gotta watch Heike Monogatari. It's that good. And that's about it. A quick view at all the different shows that I watched on the season. A very interesting season, like I said earlier. A lot of shows had a lot of promise, but I, to me at least, they didn't 100% deliver on that. Whether it be uh, voice acting, whether it be animation or pacing issues or the story itself. Sometimes I find myself just skipping through some things because I wanted to watch other stuff like Ranking of Kings or Heike Monogatari. Nonetheless, I am super excited that I got through another season. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. I do content about anime and manga, reviewing shows, reviewing manga, all that fun stuff. Thank you everybody for a wonderful year. Thank you for subscribing and being a part of We Can Geek Them. I truly do appreciate it. I've got to go. Stay safe, everybody. God bless. I will catch all of you on our next video.